Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a preview to my ClassicsToday.com insider special subscriber video of the 10 best recordings of Claudio Abbado. I've been waiting to do this one for quite a while, but now that just about all of his discography is out, we can weed through it and pull out the good stuff. But wait, you're not a subscriber to ClassicsToday.com? Please do consider. You can do it on the ClassicsToday.com homepage or with the link below this very video in its description. Please do consider signing up. We need you. You will find thousands of dedicated insider reviews with sound clips and recording comparisons and tons and tons of box sets reviewed, reviewed all kinds of good stuff, searchable by categories and artists. And oh my goodness, you're not going to believe it. So give it a shot. I think you won't be sorry. But now let's talk about Maestro Abado. As some of you who watch these videos already know, since I've covered all these box sets, I have been rather harsh um, much of the time. And the reason is because of a phenomenon that we really need to get to the bottom of in order to understand what happened with Abado, and that is the dangers of being over-recorded. Now, Abado was the second generation after conductors like Bernstein and Schulte and, you know, that crowd, the ones who we were sort of, you know, all ooing and eyeing about in the 60s and part of the 70s as well. I mean, Schulte made it much longer than that, but it was the next generation of folk. And that generation had both the good fortune and misfortune to grow up at a time when the compact disc was invented, when all of the repertoire was being re-recorded, but more to the point, when there was an enormous competition between the megacorps that controlled the classical music industry. In other words, specifically, Sony on the one hand, and BMG, which was separate, and of course, EMI was separate, and Warner was separate, but the big competition was between Sony and Universal and they were vying for the same artists. And a lot of artists were lured one way or another at various times or worked for both. And Abado was one of those. Now, was Abado so fabulous that everybody just had to have him? Well, at the time that these decisions were being made, you could argue that the answer was yes. I wouldn't have argued that, but you could. He had the most unbelievable exposure on the world stage. He was the darling of, of everywhere, just about. Figure, think about it. I mean, he conducted the London Symphony, the Vienna Philharmonic. He got the Berlin Philharmonic. He was a major guest in Chicago. He conducted at La Scala. He, had, he was the successor, in a way. Or, I mean, it's never identical, but he was, in a way, the successor to Herbert von Karajan, somebody who was everywhere doing everything. Karajan, of course, basically stayed in the Berlin-Vienna axis. Abado was far more widely traveled than that. He was much more of a jet setter. But in the new format, in the next generation and for compact discs, Abado was, was the man for quite a while. As a result of that, he had the luxury of being able to do just about anything he wanted to do. And he did. He did it to ridiculous excess. And that was the problem. I remember extremely vividly, I mean, it was yesterday, hearing the first recordings of him with the London Symphony and thinking that a lot of them were splendid, not all of them, but a lot of them were splendid. And some of them were really just just marvelous, wonderfully marvelous. I mean, there's all kinds of good stuff he did at the LSO. And then he jumped ship and started recording in Berlin and Vienna. He got the Berlin Philharmonic. After Karajan, he replaced a huge swath of the orchestra. And that's when things started to go downhill. Because, first of all, First of all, he did a tremendous amount of repertoire, both in, in, in 
the UK in London, and also as a guest conductor. He made a bunch of very fine recordings in Chicago for Deutsche Grammophon, some of which were just marvelous, some of them were less so, but most of them were really good. And I remember the excitement when they came out. You know, his was a fresh voice. He did Mahler symphonies in Chicago. It was so different from Schulte and from just about anybody else. It was wonderful to hear this new approach. Some of them were, were really, really good. Some of them were a little bit less good, but most of them were pretty good. I mean, the, those symphonies were two, four, um, what else do you do? Five, six, seven, basically two, four, five, six, seven, and one, and a digital recording, which wasn't so hot. But it was interesting. It was, it, we, we looked forward to seeing the new stuff come out. We really did. But then he just started redoing everything. And his limitations as an artist became manifest. What were those limitations? Well, first of all, he was, he was rather limited in his repertoire. We always knew that his, his classical repertoire wasn't very good. He didn't do very much of it until the very end of his career. It was never very good. And second of all, he tended to be um, a, a late romantic guy, except for a couple operas, except for Rossini, which was fantastic. And, you know, his Verdi, some of which was fantastic and some of which was curiously not depending how late you got in his career. He started to sound tired. He started to sound fussy. He was a terrible micromanager. He really was. And what's very interesting about the way his performances were received is that if you were part of my generation, if you were someone who heard all the new stuff when it came out and how much fun it was when it came out and how enjoyable it was to discover it, you, you realized how much he had declined as we got toward the end of his career. But if you were just starting out as a classical music listener, as I've seen that in the comments in this, in this forum, you know, people talk about how fabulous his recordings were with the Lucerne Festival Orchestra. No, they weren't. They weren't even as good as his earlier recordings of the same stuff. It was actually rather distressing to hear him do Mahler or whatever for the third time and do it worse and worse and worse each time. And eventually, you know, he had become one of those major grand old man artists who was just living in an artistic bubble. He could do no wrong. He was surrounded by an entourage of people who petted and stroked and told him everything he did was wonderful. He was beyond self-criticism. And it didn't matter. The labels didn't care because they just recorded everything. I mean, the Lucerne Festival Orchestra was a pickup ensemble. Now, I mean, they were a good pickup ensemble, but were they one of the great orchestras? No. And they didn't play like it. And were his performances better than the ones he'd done previously with much finer orchestras? No, they weren't. But nobody seemed to notice because, because from a practical point of view, from a marketing standpoint, he was beyond criticism. He did some atrocious things, um, just career-wise, things that nobody would have gotten away with. Think of how much money he blew working for the various labels. He did that god-awful Beethoven cycle with the Berlin Philharmonic, which Deutsche Grammophon promoted like crazy and then very surreptitiously sort of shunted aside in favor of of the soundtracks to the video performances of the same Beethoven symphonies that he did later and which were extraordinarily better than the theoretical, um, you know, definitive Beethoven recordings of Claudio Abbato. Did Claudio Abbato come out and say, oh, I'm sorry, it sucks. I'm going to give you your money back. No, of course not. Did the label say anything about it? No, of course not, because they are all infallible. They could do no wrong, but it was bad. It was just plain bad. That first Beethoven cycle, it was a mess up. Or he, he started redoing repertoire. I mean, aside from Mahler, which he did 150 times, and Bruckner's first, which he did like three or four times, there were things like, uh, it just made me crazy. When he issued the Sony recording of Rossini's Il Viaggio a Rams with half of the same cast as the DG premiere recording. I mean, that was nuts. But Sony didn't care because Sony wanted to compete with Deutsche Grammophon. I really wonder how many units they sold. 
I really do. I, it's very curious. I do know that when he insisted on doing Boris Gudunov for Sony, which is a great performance, no question about it, but he insisted on doing it, they sold less than a thousand units. And it was it was like the, the famous Lohengrin with, on RCA with, with uh, Eric Leinsdorf that caused RCA to like withdraw from doing classical records. I mean, they spent a fortune and they sold nothing. They sold none of it. Nobody wanted to hear about Otto do Boris Gudunov, however good it was. And at that point, the industry was imploding. And at one point, I remember this extremely vividly because I was I was somewhat involved in it. I mean, in the, to the extent that I was chatting with the people who were involved with it. Uh, DG issued a disc called Mahler Adagio, consisting of of Mahler slow movements from Abato's performances. And Abato immediately sued his own label, Deutsche Grammophon, to withdraw it, claiming that isolated slow movements did not represent his overall conception, and they were a disgrace to his artistic whatever, whoever, whatever. And I don't know, if I had been running Deutsche Grammophon, and I said this at the time, so if I had been running Deutsche Grammophon, I would have invited him into my office, and I would have said, Mr. Abato, these are the masters of your recordings, including your Mahler recordings. I am going to destroy one every week until there is nothing left of you, unless you stop this nonsense, because they have a right to try and sell some records and recoup their investment in this guy. And who the hell is he to tell them that they can't do it because because it doesn't it's not suitable to you know it doesn't rise to his artistic standards. This is a guy who re-recorded the same stuff twenty times. What artistic standards? He did that horrible Beethoven cycle. You know what kind of hypocrisy and foolishness is that? But these people got to do it. They get away with it, especially in Europe where the horrible Wagnerian you know romantic artist hero bullshit legend still exists. And so they're coddled and they're stroked and petted and oh, it's just awful, just awful. So anyway, so as Abato got older, his performances became, I believe, less and less interesting and weaker. And uh, certainly, certainly uh, there was no one, there, there, were, there was no one running the asylum. Nobody saying to him, no, you can't do this, or this isn't very good. There wasn't anybody to stop him from just gazing at his own navel endlessly. And I feel bad for him because of that. And the reason I feel bad for him is because he really was a very, very gifted musician. I mean, his best recordings are as good as anything anybody did anywhere. And I really think it was a disservice that he was b permitted to run amok the way he did with the record industry on the theory that anything this man touched was gold. Well, it wasn't. And that's why I am extremely happy to be able to present to you ClassicsToday.com subscribers the best of Claudio Abbado. And the best is terrific. It's absolutely terrific. And I'm happy to say so and happy to do it. So please do have a look over at classicstoday.com if you've subscribed and see what my picks are. It's, there could be more, there could always be more. There could be some, you know, some switching and change ruing if you wanted to do it that way. But I guarantee these are all fabulous performances that really represent him at his best and only highlight how sad it was that there is so much out there that does not represent him at his best. And I blame the record labels as much as I blame him. They should have been smarter. They should have been somebody there who could, you know, make a decision, an artistic decision, because some of them were just no-brainers. No, you don't have to record the same opera you recorded last year with half of the same people. You just don't. And it would have made things so much better. But as it is, that's why people like me are necessary, at least I think. So, so there you go. Keep on listening, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoy the video on the 10 best recordings of Claudio Abbado and have learned something about the dangers of overexposure. It doesn't help you. Artists take note. Take care.